Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. We are blessed with another beautiful Sunday morning out here in the park. Um, a couple announcements before we get started. Uh, as you may or may not know, um, Pastor Al and Sandy have left for their vacation, so we are happy to welcome Inza Fleetstra this morning, um, former pastor of Lansing Avenue Baptist Chapel in Sudbury for nine years, and the new uh, director, he and his wife Margaret, are the new directors out at Dorian Bible Camp. So uh, we're excited to see what happens with that ministry here in our region. And so he will be uh, giving the message this morning. So be sure to say hi to him afterward. Uh, this evening's joint uh, fellowship Baptist services, our service is at Fort William Baptist and uh, the pastor of Fort William, uh, Brad, will be speaking. And next Sunday evening, it is at Lakehead Baptist, but it will be outdoors. So if you can bring chairs, uh, we'll remind you again next week. But I think they have a bit of a covered thing there, but bring your chairs for next Sunday evening. Uh, both those are at 6.30. Let's stand and sing together about our Lord, who is our rock and our redeemer.
Thank you for each one here. Uh, thank you for this beautiful day uh, and the fellowship we can have as we sit under the teaching of your word this morning. Uh, thank you for these songs. Thank you for the words. I pray that uh, the songs and the, the message would be um, glorifying to you and that we would learn more of your will and your purpose for our lives this morning. So we thank you for all these things. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated and we'll ask Lisa to come up and share with us this morning. happy to be here. Um, yeah, it's been great moving to this new city and uh, getting to experience a lot of different churches. It's been kind of my job as of recently is getting connected with as many churches as possible. And uh, so I was able to have uh, breakfast with your pastor a little while ago and he asked me to preach and I said absolutely. And uh, so I'm excited to be here. But i um, just going to put that down. Um, I've not really done too many churches where you go on as a one-off and preach. And so I started to think, like, what do you, what do you say to a church that you don't know? What do you preach about? Um, often when I preach, I like to preach to my congregation with what they're going through. Um, and so I know a lot of guys would recycle a message that they've used before, but it wouldn't really work because I wouldn't be preaching to you guys. I'd be preaching to them, and they wouldn't be here to hear it. Um, so I began to think, and over the last couple of months and years, I've been doing a lot of contemplation over... What is the purpose of the church? It's been something that's been um, just really heavy on my heart recently, and I feel that the church has, um, to some degree, lost its purpose. And in my notes, I'm going to say it probably again, but um, when I talk about the church this morning, I'm not talking about the church, the organization, but I'm talking about us, the church. Right? The church, the organization, our purpose is to equip you guys, me, the church, the saints, to go and do the work that God has called us to. Um, but I've really been, as I've been watching, I've been in ministry, pastoral ministry, for almost 15 years. I was serving at Lansing for the last nine of those 15 years. I've also been involved in other parachurch organizations over the years. I grew up in the church. My dad is a pastor. I am churched, to say the least. And so I've been watching the church for a long time, and um, there's been some things that I've been noticing that have been concerning. Before we get into it, I'm going to open with prayer, and uh, we'll dive in. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together to serve you, to worship you here in this beautiful place. Lord, and I pray today that you would speak through me and speak through your word this morning. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. I thought I was going to take off my sunglasses, but I'm not going to. I hope that's okay. 
Um, <clears throat> so a few weeks ago, my family and I went to Manitoba. And I don't know if you've ever been to Manitoba. I'm assuming you have, because we're in Thunder Bay, and where else do you go but Winnipeg? <laughs> um, but my kids had never been to Manitoba before. And so as we started getting closer, and we started getting into the, the fields and the farmland, they were like, whoa. They couldn't believe how flat it was. They were like, what is this place? So of course, being a dad, just had to start making all those you know, cringeworthy dad jokes, right? So anytime we get to like a slight lip, I'd be like, guys, this is the highest hill in all of Manitoba. Just giving them a hard time. And uh, we got to this one place where you could just see, felt like forever in any direction. You could just see all over the place. And so again, I didn't waste that opportunity as a good dad. And I said, you know, when we get to our friend's house, we were going to stay with some friends. I said, we need to be nice to them because their dog just ran away. But it took three days. And they just like could not get it. They did not get the joke. It just missed altogether. And instead, they became enraged. And they're like, what's wrong with those people? Why would they let their dog run away for three days? Could they just get in their car and drive after it? Like, what are they doing? So I was trying to explain my joke to them. I was like, no, no, it's just so flat. You can just see forever. So if your dog runs away, it takes three days. They did not get it. Just get in your car and go and get the dog. Like, come on. So I was like, ah, uh, flop. But as I was thinking about that trip and getting ready for the sermon, I thought, you know what? That's kind of what we've been experiencing in the church. We've been slowly moving away from our purpose as the church. Um, and it's just one day at a time, just slowly further moving away. And so... As a pastor, my heart has been to run down those people in my church that I saw slowly moving away from the purpose. I'm not going to just sit back and watch them run. So this morning, the intent of my message is for you to consider yourself. I'm not preaching at you. I don't know any of you here. I don't know a single person, so it's perfect. So you might be the best Christian. You might be fulfilling it perfectly. That's great. You might be somewhere in the middle or you might be doing a bad job. It doesn't matter. I don't know. I don't know you. So the whole purpose is that you would consider what I'm saying, reflect on yourself, reflect on how your life measures up to the purpose that God has called us to. To do that, we'll need to be online. Siri thinks that I'm talking to her. That's going to be annoying. Uh, sorry about that. So, without further ado, let's look at the purpose of the church. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to with me. That. You'll need to be online. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> it takes three days to go away. <laughs> there we go. Okay, we, we got it. Um, turn with me to Matthew 28, verses 18 to 19. I'm reading from the ESV this morning. We're the, starting in verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You ever been confused before? I like not really athletic, like I'm pseudo-athletic, but I like to play sports, but I'm not good at sports. You ever play a game or a sport with people who are incredibly competent at that sport, and then you're just kind of like, ugh. So I started playing Ultimate Frisbee, and there's like, I just think Frisbee, like you just throw the disc, like it's, it's not a big deal, but it's like, no, like there's zones, there's lanes, and you've got your cup defense, there's man, there's all this like nuance to the game that I never understood. And so I'm just running around like an idiot. Like I'm just like, there's a disc, I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna, <sighs> Siri, be quiet. I'm just running around foolishly trying to stop. Okay, I don't know how to turn Siri off. I don't know what to do. Oh, I know the problem. There we go. It's the magnet. It's tripping it. All right. Um, yeah, just running around like a complete buffoon, not knowing what to do. And all my friends were like, this is what you do. This is where you're supposed to be. I'm like, I'm so lost. I'm so confused. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if you've ever felt that way before in anything, whether it's sport or in life or in any scenario. But what I love about the Great Commission is there's no confusion, right? You open up this passage, even if you're not a theologian, even if you haven't gone to Bible college, even if you haven't spent 
time and days and years studying the text, you read it, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Right? We don't read in there. There's no credentials in there. There's not, if you meet these credentials, if you're this person. He's like, if you are going to follow me, go and make disciples of all nations. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty clear. And that, in a nutshell, is our purpose. The church is to go and make disciples of all the nations. But let's take a closer, closer look, starting in verse 18. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is the first time in the New Testament, I don't know if you've noticed that, but this is the first time in the New Testament that Christ asserts his own authority. All, right, all the rest of the time throughout the New Testament, whenever we see Christ, Christ is talking on behalf of the Father. It is God's authority, right? We see in Philippians, Philippians 2, where Christ humbles himself. It says, in being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on the cross. Jesus knew ultimately at the start it was God's authority. He was there because of God's authority, but now he's been exalted. In Philippians, it carries on. He says, therefore, right, because of Christ's death on the cross, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at every name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. Right, so up until this point, Jesus was humble. Jesus was acting under the authority of God, but now Christ is back in resurrected form. He raised from the dead. This is exciting. The disciples have only seen him a handful of times after watching him die, and he's back, and he's resurrected. He's like, all authority has been now given to me. And then he commissions his followers to start the church, right? This is the beginning of the church as we know it today. The Great Commission is the starting of the church. And it's to those, his followers there, but it's also to those that would then come along us, right, 2,000 years later, who carry on the work that he started before us. And they, the early church, they were so confident in Christ, right? They, they saw Christ rise from the dead. They knew that Christ conquered death. They knew that there was nothing that could stand against them if God came back from the dead and had all authority and he was ultimate authority over everything, right? And so if we are in Christ and Christ is in us and he's the ultimate authority over everything, then who could stand against us? And that was what inspired them to go, right? Many of them went to their deaths. Many of them went to places that were hostile, but unashamed without throwing caution to the wind, they went and they brought forward the gospel something that I often say is this church, my church, wherever we are, Dorian, the camp even, we are a direct result of the faithfulness of those people 2,000 years ago, which is pretty cool to think about, right? We're a direct result of their faithfulness. But fast forward 2,000 years, do we still believe this to be true? Right, on paper we might say, yeah, of course I believe that God has all authority, but do our actions show that when we went out west to um, when we went out west to Winnipeg, before we went to Winnipeg, we went through the states and we went to Minneapolis and we stayed at Great Wolf Lodge. And I don't know if you've been to that Great Wolf Lodge, um, but it was like a little sketchy. I'm not a welder, but I have a little bit of experience in the trades. And there's this one water slide. It's, it was sweet. It was a lot of fun. It's like this big raft, and your whole family gets in it, and it's pitch black the whole time. It's terrifying. It was awesome. My kids wouldn't go back on it. My wife wouldn't go back on it. I was super sad because I wanted to go back on it. They wouldn't. But the part that scared me of that ride the most is as I'm walking up, you're just in these like stairwell, this is spiral stairwell, and they're hanging from the ceiling. And you're standing below, and you look at the stairs, and the wells on the stairs that are holding the people up from plummeting 25 feet to most likely their death were all rusted out, like completely rusted out. I'm like, oh, man. I was like, well, I'm like, I'm not going to say it because you will turn around and walk down and I want to ride this ride. So I'm going to keep that to myself. But I'm not really afraid of heights. Like I climb, that's kind of my background. And I was gripping that railing like white knuckle and like holding my daughter's hand the whole time because I'm like, we're going to die. Because I had no faith in those stairs. I was like, they are not going to hold. And I like 
little, I haven't done it, but I'm like a little bit considering putting a Google alert on for that Great Wolf Lodge because one day you're going to read the news, stairwell falls out and people die. Um, people are like, we're planning a trip there next week. Sorry if I ruined your vacation. Um, it was terrifying because I didn't believe in the stairs. I didn't trust the stairs. I was like, these stairs don't look good. And so as much as those stairs were there to keep me safe, a little bit of my personality was I need to hold onto this rail or the wall or something else, something extra. It's the stairs and whatever I can do to make sure that my family and I, who cares about the water slide, survive just waiting in line. And every time someone would like walk by to go down because there's another slide, you feel like the whole stair just like sag and you're like gripping a little tighter. And I think that that's become many of us in the church today. We have full confidence in Christ on paper Right, like I stood on those stairs, but I was gripping that rail. We say, yes, we're fully surrendered our lives to Christ. But when push comes to shove, maybe we're also concerned about saving ourselves a little bit too, right? By making sure we have enough for our family set aside in case something would happen. Making sure we have the right connection with the right people, the right job, whatever it is, whatever your own extra little safety net looks like, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. We have a safety net to set aside. I'm not condemning anyone that does that. Um, but there is certainly a difference between trusting in God and not fully trusting in God. And, and a lot of people, I know they, when God is good, when life is good, they're like, yes, God is good. But when life is bad, they're like, I've got to do this myself. I've got to save myself. I can't commit to the church right now because life is not good. And so I have to do these things to get myself back up to this approved appropriate status where then life is good and then I can be like, yes, Jesus again. Because we haven't recognized fully what it means when Christ said, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Verse 19. <clears throat> it says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Christ now Next sentence, first he establishes himself as the authority on this topic. He then changes our perspective on how we come to God. Right? He's setting up the new covenant. Even in his statement to go into all the world, to go to the Gentiles is what he was saying, to go to those people that are not from us, was very different than the tradition of the Hebrew people. This is the first time, really, that we are seeing this missionary movement. There were a few that happened in the Old Testament, but they were different, and we're going to look at those. Right before Christ, there was only a handful of prophets who were sent out into the Gentile world. There's a few. The, the top three are um, Obadiah, Jonah, and Nahum. Right, and Obadiah went out. He was probably the first guy to go out to the Gentile world. And he doesn't go and say, hey, repent and come to God, and you'll be saved. He says... You've spat on our God, you're going to be destroyed. And then drops his mic and walks out. Oh, what do we do? Jonah then is the first one. I always used to say Jonah was the first missionary movement because he actually gave people a chance. Jonah goes, and if you know the story of Jonah, it's a sad story for Jonah more than anyone else, but Jonah goes to Nineveh and he was told to preach 40 days to repent or they'd be destroyed. And of course, right, like single greatest preacher of all time because the population of that city was over 100,000 people and he preached maybe once and the whole city came to Christ or came to God in that moment like I don't know what he said but that guy was the greatest speaker of all time but he gave them 40 days and there was no follow up for Jonah required there was no discipleship required there was no setting up the church required there was no teaching the people of Nineveh how to live so that not only could they follow God but they could establish a church which would teach their people for generations it was 40 days your choice take it or leave it I'm out of here and then he went and sat in the desert and sulked Right, And then a couple hundred years later, it didn't take that long, maybe not even a couple hundred, maybe about 150 or so, we see Nahum goes back to Nineveh. And again, doesn't give them a timeline. He's like, you knew, you turned your back, God is going to destroy you. And he did. And that was, that was the theme of going to the Gentile world. You go to the Gentile world to maybe give them a chance, but ultimately you preach God's destruction will come upon you swiftly and quickly and immediately unless you turn and then the prophets would go back to the Hebrew people and they would leave them alone. Right, in those days the focus was more about the tabernacle and the Jewish laws and customs and traditions 
you effectively had to become a Jewish citizen if you wanted to follow God. That was essentially what it came down to. If you want to follow our God, the one true God, which they would go around telling everyone about our God is the one true God, if you wanted to follow him, you had to leave your way of life and you had to join the Jewish people's way of life and live effectively as a Jewish person in order to be saved. Otherwise, destruction and brimstone was your result. Christ now was changing it. It was a come and see at their point, right? They, you can read Exodus. You can see all the work that was put into the tabernacle. They had this big show, all the gold. This is how great our God is. Look at our God, right? It was a come and see us, come and learn from us, come and be with us, come and see philosophy of ministry that God had them do. And when Jesus came, Jesus flipped that philosophy and he said, instead of them coming to us, we're going to go to them. We're going to go where they are. We're not going to be set aside anymore. We're not going to be hiding kind of in our tabernacle and our temples. We're not going to be inward focused. We're going to be outward focused. We're going to go out to where the people are, to where the hurting are, where the poor, where the broke are. And we're going to bring the good news of my life that I died on the cross for their sins to them. The good news of the gospel to them. He flipped it. Furthermore, Matthew Henry notes that the word go, which was interesting, I hadn't heard this before, but the word go is, is not explicitly just a command. It's not just a command. It's not you have to go. I'm commanding you to go. But in, in combination with his, I have all authority, it was an encouragement. It was... Go is more than just a command. It's also a sense of encouragement with the, I am sending you. I am in control. You can go. There's nothing holding you back anymore. I have all authority. Go. Don't be afraid. Paul deals with this to Timothy in his letter in 2 Timothy 1 verse 6. Paul writes to Timothy, For this reason I am sending you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor me, his prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus, who abolished death, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard until the day which he has entrusted to me. All right, Paul's, Paul's telling Timothy, don't be afraid. I know that there's people who would disagree with you who don't like you for what you're preaching. Don't hide in the church. Don't stay in the church and focus just on the church your command to go and tell and not to be afraid because God is over everything. Christ is over everything and we're in Christ. And so there is nothing in our path. There's nothing holding us back. If Jesus has sent us, what do we have to be worried about? As I just spoke about a minute ago, we saw the prophets were sent out from time to time, but with little responsibility of the prophet, the onus was on the hearers to respond. And now Jesus is saying, preach, yes, share the gospel, yes, but make disciples. It's another area that I think that many churches struggle with, and sometimes it's because we don't know how, or sometimes it's because the people we're trying to disciple don't want to be discipled. There's a lot of reasons why discipleship is challenging, and I totally get that as a pastor for a long time. You know, you'll You'll spend days, weeks, months, hours pouring into these people, and then one day they'll just get up and walk away, and you're like, I gave you everything, and now you're just gone, and I totally get the challenge. But the picture of discipleship is more than just, I'm going to sit down beside you, and I'm going to tell you how you ought to live your life. The picture of discipleship is walking alongside somebody, right, and going through their life together as well as your life, going through the highs and the lows, dealing with the struggles of their people, right? Life is dirty. Life is challenging. We like, I don't know if your church is like this, but certainly my church and I, I always kind of got frustrated when we said it, but my, my, one of the pastors at our church would always say, his challenge was to be nice, neat, normal people. And he would preach that from the pulpit. I was like, Mark, you're wrong. Like, 
There's no such thing as nice, neat, normal people. And there's no nice, neat, normal people outside the church. People outside the church are hurting and broken and lost and scared people. And if we come at them being like, okay, like you have to fit into this box and then we'll disciple you, they're going to be like, well, I don't fit into that box, so I can't be discipled. And they're going to walk away and it's not going to be effective, right? Even Christ spent three years walking alongside his, his 12 men who were at the best of times challenging and at the worst of times incredibly frustrating, even to the point where when he needed them the most, they abandoned him and turned their back on him. Right, but Christ didn't give up on them and that's the picture of discipleship. Fast forward to today. For one reason or another, we the church, we the people, we have moved away from this go and tell mandate that Christ gave us. And we've tried to resurrect the come and see model of ministry. We do these ministries in our church. We invite, invite your friends to us. Invite them to come in. Invite them to youth group. Invite them to our kids club. Invite them to our men's breakfast. Invite them to our, our ladies' tea or whatever. That's some things that our church used to do. I never went to the ladies' tea. It wasn't my thing. Um, right, but it was invite them in. Bring them in and then like those in charge in the church, well, they'll, they'll do whatever those in charge of the church do and they'll tell them about Jesus. And I like did my job. I invited them here and my, I can wash my hands. I did my work. That's not the picture that we're getting in scripture anywhere. Never in my time studying scripture have I come across Jesus saying, here's how church works. You, the people, invite them to church, and then you walk away, and the pastors will just pour into them, and you have done your duty. Now go find some more people and rope them in, right? Discipleship means coming alongside someone and going through life with them, the highs and the lows. What I've seen in the church today in general, and again, I've never been to your church, so I don't know, but what I've seen in the church today are Christians who are more concerned with Christian things than we are with Christ. We have to have the Christian feel. We have to do the Christian things. But if we were actually to live the way Christ called us to live, a lot of those things that we like to do, would, we wouldn't have time to do them. And I love church program, and I'm not saying let's get rid of church program. I mean, my job was basically being a church programmer, so I would be out of work if I was you know, preaching that. There is a purpose for church program, absolutely. But if we live for the church program, then really at the end of the day, what we're doing is we are worshiping the church and we're not worshiping Christ. And that is something I have absolutely seen are Christians who have fallen victim to idol worship of the church, who know more about the lead Christian celebrities than they do about theology, who are more concerned with how many badges their kid got a wanna and less concerned with how many kids their friends are telling about Christ. Because we've fallen in love with the church. And I don't mean that in a good way. It is good to love the church. It is important to love the church. Christ loved the church. I love the church. But when the church takes the place of Christ in our hearts, that becomes an issue. That becomes idol worship. And a lot of us, if we're being honest, a lot of us would rather go out and preach. You know, we know we're called to share the gospel, but I don't want to do the work of discipleship. So a lot of us would rather have that go into our office tomorrow morning. Monday morning, you get up, stand on your desk, and say, 40 days. Repent or you'll all be destroyed and this office will be turned to ash. And then you sit down and be like, job done. I told them, I don't have to worry about it. Right, but instead of doing that, we don't want to bring, come alongside them to bring the gospel to those who need to hear it. So again, my intent of this message, because I don't know you guys, which is great, is inward reflection. How does your life reflect the great commission that we were called to? Are you unashamed? Are you confident that God has ultimate authority, that Christ is all authority? Do you live that way? Or is there a part of you that's like, I believe in God on Sunday, but, you know, I want to make sure that my kids are, my kids' grandkids are set up in case the stocks change, right? Are we taking risks and sharing the gospel with people who need to hear it? Are we risking getting connected to people that we might not want to really talk to because we would rather have a conversation with someone who we don't really like because they're different than us? and see that person spend eternity separated from God in hell. Again, this message isn't intended to call anyone out 
but to call us to look at our own lives and to consider how we match up to the Great Commission. I, I told you this first statement at the start of the message, I used to say to my students that our church is a direct result of the faithfulness of those originally sent out by Jesus. But the follow-up question to that statement is, assuming God would tarry for 2,000 years, which I hope he doesn't, but assuming he does, based on what we're doing, where will the church be in another 2,000 years based on our efforts? Do we really have confidence that Christ is the authority above above all, or are we still trusting ourselves? Are we really prepared to do the work that we've been called to, or are we more concerned about doing church things? Let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this awesome place to be outside to preach your word, God, and I thank you for this church, uh, Lord, and I pray that as all of us reflect on the calling that you've placed on us, I pray that we would all Recognize our strengths and recognize our weaknesses. Recognize the areas where we need to do better and areas where uh, we're doing great, Lord. And I pray that as a result of this church, we would see the gospel go forward in Thunder Bay and that we would see lives changed and that your kingdom would grow. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. I'm not sure if I turn it back over or are we dismissed. We're dismissed. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me this morning.